Okay. First of all, I want to thank PHEC and the Foundation and Kohler for having me do this webinar for you this afternoon. I appreciate your time. I know the most valuable thing that we have is time, and I want to promise you that I am not going to waste your time today. I'm going to give you 17 ways to stay profitable and, and really sleep better at night. My thing has always been profitability. I have been working with plumbing, electrical, heating, and air contractors since the late 1980s, and I've always been passionate about doing things that help you get more profitable, get more cash in the bank, things that help you be better at what you're doing. And I promise you that by the end of the session, you'll have at least one or two, if not more, ideas that you can implement immediately. All of these are done and they're all proven. They're all things that I have worked with with my clients over the years. And I want to share them with you today. So I want you to think about if you had all the cash in the bank that you wanted and you could sleep through the night, and your business was profitable 11 or preferably 12 months out of the year, what would that do to you? I mean, how would you feel? Would you feel, okay, this is absolutely great, I'm going to keep going, or I'm totally bored and I don't know what to do with myself, and subconsciously you screw everything up. And probably some of you are laughing right now, but I've had situations where we've fixed the messes with contractors, they're doing phenomenally well, and they are totally bored. So they have to do something to meddle with the business rather than going and finding a hobby. I promise all of you, if you are fixing everything, go find a hobby and do something else so that you don't screw it up again. Um, I've been helping, as we said, contractors for the, over 25 years, and I do seminars and forums like this individually, internet, classroom, group training. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the worst business owner I've ever worked with. He started in Texas, and they had a negative $400,000 net worth, meaning that if they closed their business, they would have had to write a check for $400,000 to pay off all of their bills. And they said, I need some help, obviously. And we ended up getting them out of trouble. They are profitable to today with a positive net worth. We did not file bankruptcy, but we did talk to all of their creditors, and they let us put the plan together and work the plan. So. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, and I've seen the ugly, and all of them can be fixed if you want to get them all fixed, and you can always be profitable. So the first question I have for you is, what is profit? And most of you are going to say, well, it's money in the bank, or maybe it's cash, or something that allows me to make money. The real definition of profit is just that revenue is greater than expenses. That's it. Loss is expenses greater than revenue. So profit is not the amount of cash that you have in the bank. It is just saying that for a month or a period of time that you had more revenue than expenses, and a loss says that you have more expenses than you had revenue for that period of time. You can have tons of money in the bank and a loss, or you can have no money in the bank and great profits, as all of you have seen, I'm sure, over the time period from time to time. So profitability really is where we're going here because profits are important, but profitability is even more important. So profitability is sustained profits, showing that you're profitable month after month or year after year. So we're looking at January being profitable, February being profitable, March being profitable, April, May, June, July, and you continually grow the business through being profitable. That's what profitability is. And we can think of financial profitability, but we also have sales profitability, we have employee profitability, we have operational profitability, and we have marketing profitability. So for example, you know, in marketing profitability, the last marketing pieces that you sent out, if you mailed them, did they produce profits for you? Yes or no? Are your employees profitable, i.e., are you billing as many hours of their time as you can? Each one of them can be a mini profit and loss statement. Your plumbers can, your HVAC technicians can. Everybody can have their own mini profit and loss statement. So are they generating profits for your company? If they're not, you don't need them. And sometimes that's really tough because people do really, really well for a period of time. And then all of a sudden something happens and they stop being profitable for you. And unfortunately, if your employees are not profitable for you, you don't need them. And it's really tough for somebody who been an employee for 10 or 15 years, and then they lose their profitability. I know. I ended up having to put a guy on part-time who had worked for me for 10, 15 years, and he just couldn't handle it anymore. 
and it, it was harder on me than it actually was on him when I actually made, had the conversation with him. He just said, okay. And I think he got it even before, before I did. So profitability is really, really important from a people perspective, from a financial perspective, from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective. So every part of your business has to be profitable and have long-term profitability. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a lot about what I call the cycle. Everything that you do really is dependent upon maintenance. And plumbing, heating and air, and to some extent electrical too, but maintenance agreements should be the foundation of your company. Now I know many, many times there's much more resistance on the plumbing side than the heating and air side, but you can do something productive for all of your customers on a plumbing once a year maintenance, as long as everybody is aware of what it is, what the product is, what the services are, and what you're actually going to do. The reason I say that is that maintenance ties you to the customer. The customer is loyal to you. They've signed a piece of paper that basically said that they will use your company when they have a problem. And you say that you're going to go come to their home once a year or twice a year, um, if it's a heating and air, once for heating, once for cooling, and you're going to perform specific services and make sure that their system is in the best operational condition for that particular period of time. And then maintenance will give you service. It will give you replacements or jobs or those types of um, um, anything that is replacing a unit, replacing a, a sink, replacing a you know, lavatory, whatever. Um, all of those things happen a lot of times because you perform maintenance on somebody's home. And it's a big circle with maintenance at the top and the other two kind of falling into the circle from there. All right, so let's get into the 17 things. Number one is that you've got to have profitable pricing. And I'm going to use the word profitable and profitability here over and over again. So we have to have service profitable pricing, maintenance profitable pricing, replacement profitable pricing. All of these areas of your company have to be profitable. Now, the question normally comes up with maintenance is, well, you know, I don't necessarily want to make money. I look at maintenance as a loss. And my answer to that is that we are not a supermarket. We can't sell milk for a buck as a loss leader because people will come into our stores and buy all this other food and you know drugs and whatever and make up for this loss leader that got them into the store. In my book, and the way I look at it, maintenance has to at least break even. I mean, you can have zero profit and zero loss, but maintenance also has to break even. And service and replacement need to have the pricing that you want to have it to have. All right, so let's take a look at um, the way I look at pricing. So we, we start with sales. We subtract out our cost of sales. That's equal to our gross profit. Subtract out our overhead, and that's our net operating profit. And you'll notice to the right there are three GP per hour, overhead per hour, and NP per, per hour, which is net profit per hour, overhead per hour, and gross profit per hour. So what we need to really and truly understand is how much net profit per hour do we want on the bottom line? How much for every billable hour, how much do we want to net? All the other percentages don't matter. All the other gross margin doesn't matter because gross margin doesn't cover, and you'll see this in a little bit, it doesn't cover overhead issues. And so you can have two jobs with the same gross margin, one that you did really, really well on, and one where you actually had an incredible loss on. So we want to look at what profit per hour you actually want to earn. And we do this many, many years ago. We divided by one minus the gross margin to get the, the prices that we sold at. You know, it's the old pricing manual method, and it can get you in trouble. And it really and truly isn't a picture of profitability. So, I mean, most of us grew up, including myself. I mean, I used to teach, the, teach it this way. But I found, you know, working with the clients that I work with, that in the 2005, 6, 7 time frame, that even with these great gross margins, they still weren't very profitable on the bottom line. And then it hit me that when we divide by 1 minus the gross margin, we aren't taking into account overhead. And this is what I mean by this. This is a, a, a graph where we have 20 customers for, for a company I started working with. And generally, when I work with companies, I will go pull 20 jobs. I don't let them pull jobs, say, oh, this one's good. I, you can see this one, this one was bad. You can't see that one. Forget it. I pulled 20 jobs. And so we have the customer. I just put their initials in there. The selling price of that job, GP is the gross profit. GM is the gross margin, which is simply um, gross profit divided by sales. OH per hour is their overhead cost per hour. Number of hours on that job, the net profit, and the net profit per hour. 
okay? So if we take the first one, which is JE, and sell price was $12,903, our gross margin was 40.51%, and our net profit per hour was $73.34. Good, bad, or indifferent? I don't know. Depends on what you want to earn as a net profit per hour. Then we go down to the middle of the page where we have HT, and that job was $5,644. The gross margin was 40.27% which is not much different than 40.51%. And if we go over to the right, we've lost $21.37 an hour. So for every hour those guys were on that job, they paid the customer $21.37. So they gave them a $20 bill, a $1 bill, and 37 cents for every hour. But the margins were almost identical, you know, 0.27 to 0.51. Not exactly a, a large amount. So one's earning the company $73.34, the other one is paying the customer to do that job for all intents and purposes. When you do an exercise like this, number one, you really opens your eyes because you find out which crews are good and which crews are bad. Because if you look, there was a negative $21.37, there was a negative $20.11, and there were some jobs that were like $6.03 and $4.68, and yet there was a job for $125 an hour that they made on the bottom line. So we have this huge dichotomy in terms of what we actually brought home. Not what our margins were, but what we actually contributed to the bottom line when we did this job. As it turned out, the crew that was doing the negative 20s and the negative 21s was the crew that was always complaining that they didn't have enough time on the jobs. And the crews that were doing really well, like the 73 and the 125 and the 84 and the 92, were doing incredibly well, not complaining, getting their jobs done in the times that it was supposed to get done. And so the crew that was screwing up went through what I call my career readjustment program, i.e. they got fired. Because why would you pay a customer $20 to do a job? You wouldn't, not knowingly. Um, so that's why dividing by one minus the gross margin really and truly doesn't work. You've got to really look at your overhead cost per hour and your net profit per hour. And the overhead cost per hour is just simply, if you look at last year's numbers, your total overhead last year divided by your total billable hours last year. And their overhead cost per hour was $60.20 when we started. For most plumbing and HVAC companies, their service departments should be somewhere between 35, 30, somewhere between 30 and 40 dollars per hour, as close to 30 as you can get it. If you're doing jobs, you're doing replacements, it should be about 25 dollars an hour to 20 dollars an hour. Larger companies and really, really well, I should say great productive companies are in the 20 dollar to 21 and I've seen a few at 18, 19 that I also work with. So we had a problem there with productivity and just by dropping the overhead cost per hour by $30, that adds $30 to the bottom line for every hour that you build. And we, and we did it. So this should be an eye-opening experience for you. Go back after this webinar and just check out some of your jobs and see how much profit you actually earn for every billable hour on that job. All right, so number two, if you're pricing right, you've got to know your net profit per hour. And net profit per hour is just simply your, your total operating profit, so last year's operating profit, divided by your total billable hours. Last year's operating profit before you took out um, other expenses or other income, and this is what I mean by other expenses and the other income. Say, for example, you had a huge expense because you bought another company. There was a large legal expense that was a one-time thing. So you actually paid your attorney, let's say, $10,000, which is not normal. You paid him because you were buying another company. Is it a business expense? Yes. But did it affect your operations? Really and truly, no, because it was a, a business formation type expense. So that's what I mean by operating profit. is the profit you earn from doing business, doing service, doing maintenance, doing replacement, and those types of things. And billable hours are basically just that, billable hours. You've got to know how many, for every hour a technician or a field employee bills you versus how many hours they actually are paid on their paycheck. And this number can be very sobering for you also. But it's a good number to track 
And I find that if you do track this, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, the non-billable hours have a tendency to go down. Amazing, isn't that happens? All right. The third one is to know your overhead cost per hour. And, and like your net profit per hour, it's just simply your total overhead divided by your total billable hours. And this one, you know, like your net profit per hour, is just very, very easy to calculate. You know what your overhead is. You know what your billable hours are. Divide the two. And I don't suggest doing these numbers every single month because billable hours can change depending upon seasonality. Some months you're incredibly busy. Other months you're not as busy. And that will, that will change your overhead cost per hour. This is a number you do once a year, at most twice a year. And you, and you stick with it for a year. And then at the end of the year, you calculate it again. So it either goes up or hopefully goes down. And then next year, you can use a lower number to actually create your pricing. The other question that I always get asked is, what is a good net profit per hour? And quite frankly, that's totally up to you. What I like to say, and these are some industry averages. The net profit per hour for service generally is around $50 to $100 an hour, depending upon what you're doing. That means for every billable hour, you bring home, on the bottom line, somewhere between $50 and $100 an hour. A lot of companies use 75, which is right in the middle of that. If it's a slower period of time, you may want to drop that down to $25 an hour so that you get work. The uh, um, net profit per hour for replacements is a general rule, or project work generally depends upon the type of work that you're doing it. I've seen it as low as $100 an hour. I've seen it as high as $500 an hour. So it just kind of depends upon the type of equipment that you're using, how much you're comfortable with actually earning per hour. And my maintenance net profit per hour is actually $5. I mean, I believe that you should make a little bit on everything you do at the very least. So maintenance, for all intents and purposes, is break even. So I put $5 an hour in there just so that there is some profitability there. And what you'll do is you'll figure out where you want to be and then calculate your pricing based on that. All right? So number four is to track your billable hours and total payroll hours and post the percentages each week. And, and this is why I talk about that, is the fact that what gets tracked and what gets mentioned and what gets posted gets fixed. If you, if you track everybody's – I'm not saying that you track the exact numbers on the board, but you'll track it in an Excel spreadsheet or something along those lines. And what you'll do is you'll have John, 68%, Steve, 92%, you know, and whatever else it is. And whoever's on bottom – doesn't want to be on bottom. It's embarrassing for them. And we're not telling them exactly how many hours, and we're not telling them exactly what their pay is, but we're saying what the percentages is, percentages are each week. And as a result of doing that, you're in a situation where the, the billable hours go up, the unproductive hours go down, and it actually does. Okay. Number five is very, very similar, which is to track service truck revenue and the post the dollars each month. In this particular case, I will post dollars. And you look at it because different field personnel do different things. So a guy who's doing maintenance should only be um, compared to guys, other guys who are doing maintenance. They will never, ever, I shouldn't say never, ever, they'll be one time in a million, um, do the same revenue per month as a guy who's running commercial service. It doesn't usually happen. But take all the service guys. And, and post them if they're all doing a specific type of work, if they're all doing residential work, post them once again against each other. And then if they're all doing commercial work, put all those guys together. And the guys who are doing maintenance, put them together. I have a service manager that I started doing this, and he started posting it every single month. And the guys obviously ran to his office knowing what day of month he was actually posting this. And if he, he missed a day or was a day late, everybody goes, where's the numbers? Where's the numbers? And everybody wanted to be on top. Nobody wanted to be on the bottom. And what it did was it did really cool things for the company. It did really good things for the customer. Because what we found is that they were 
not mentioning things to the customer that the customer needed to know about their plumbing or heating and air system. And as a result of, of this contest type thing, they were educating the customers about things that are, are there. It wasn't causing a problem yet, but it might in the future. And some of those customers go, fix it now. I don't care. I don't want to have a problem later on. And they did. So, you know, a lot of times you can just generate additional revenue by keeping your eyes open. And this is, and they post it every single month. So everybody knows who's on top. Everybody knows who's on bottom. Number six is what I call ticket files. And what you do with a ticket file is you review all of your service tickets. If your technicians are doing their jobs properly, and even your installation crews, they are writing down the good, the bad, and there should not be any bad with installs, but with, with service, there's going to be the good and the bad. And my saying is, if you don't write, write it down, it never happened, or you never said it. So if a technician comes to you after a customer complains, and the tech said, well, I told her that, and the answer should be, did you write it down? And if the answer is no, well, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Customers don't remember what you tell them because they don't get a lot of what we do. So as a result of that, you want to make sure that you write everything down, the customer signs it, and then the customer can't come back and say he never said that simply because it's in writing either in electronic form on a service ticket or on a paper service ticket. So essentially there, you're going to write everything down. You're going to write things down that you say. And the tickler file is used to record the things that you, the technicians and field personnel saw in the field, and customer chose, no, nah, I don't want to do it right now. Or recommendations that a plumber made, and the customer said, no, nah, I don't want to do that right now. And all of this goes in the tickler file. So when the work slows down, you can pull out this tickler file, and your dispatcher can say, Mrs. Jones, the last time John was there, he recommended that X be done. Um, John's available tomorrow or Friday, which would you prefer? And, or which fits your schedule best? And customers are going to say, oh my gosh, thank you very much. I totally forgot about that. Or, no, I still don't want to do that. But it's additional work that you can get simply because you've written things down, you've put them in a file. Um, I proved this point one day with a guy, even before we had tickler files per se, I said, just go through your service tickets for the past six months. And he did. And he found $4,000 in work. That could have been done. So the thing to remember is eyes and ears are in the field. Make sure that you record it either electronically or on paper. And what the customer chooses not to have done, you put in a tickler file. And the tickler file can be electronic on your dispatch board, or it can be a paper file in somebody's drawer. It does not matter. It's just work that can be done at some point in time later. Number seven is contests. I love contests. All right? And the reason that I love contests is they build esprit de corps, and they're fun when everybody is winning and everybody is doing really, really well. And if you make it fun, it actually does become a lot of fun. And you can do contests for service agreement, leads for replacement, leads for commercial agreements. And, and one of my favorite ones to do once a year is for revenues. And if, you're in, if you and your company have never reached a certain level of revenue, so for example, I was working with a, with a contractor in, in Colorado who in the month of July, because it's a slower month for them, they're heating and air, not plumbing, um, they had never reached $200,000 in revenue. And we did the numbers and we said, okay, if the company as a whole reaches $200,000 in revenue, every employee, every employee, not just field employees, but every employee was going to get a bonus of $100, all right? If the company reached $200,000 in July and August, the bonus was going to be $300. And we had done the numbers to make sure the company was still profitable if everybody did this. Well. In July, they had all spent their $100. They were saying, okay, I'm going to use it for this, use it for this, use it for this. And yes, they made July's numbers. They came close in August, but didn't make it for the 300. So, but it was really interesting to watch them, you know, having spent the money already before they even got it. And that's what they'll do. And they get excited about it, and, and they help you generate the revenues to make that happen. 
my rule about contests, like for service agreements or leads for replacement or commercial agreements, are that everybody wins or everybody loses. So for example, the group as a whole says we want to enroll 50 maintenance agreements over the next three months. So if the group as a whole enrolls 50 maintenance agreements and we will get an extra spiff or we will get a gift card for X number of dollars to whatever store it is, that's cool. But if the group as a whole doesn't reach 50, everybody pays a penalty. And my favorite penalty is that they teach a class and they bring the donuts for class during a service meeting. And it can be a 10 or 15 minute talk on a particular topic. And you always choose the topic that that field employee, that plumber or that service technician is weak in because he doesn't want to look bad in front of his peers. And I promise you they hate teaching class. They much rather like it the other way. And you can do the same thing for leads and, and it works very, 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 very well. It's fun to do, especially the revenue one once a year. And it was like, okay, last year was 200. Let's do, try and do 250 this year. And it's year after year after year, you can get the numbers up and profitable numbers, of course. All right. Uh, number nine is my favorite, one of my favorite ones. It's called salesperson hours versus actual install hours. And this is when a salesperson goes in and says, okay, it's going to take 10 hours to do this project. And the installation guys go out there and go, is he crazy? There's no way in God's green earth that anybody can do this in 10 hours. It's going to take us at least two full days. Salesperson did it at 10 hours because he wanted to get the job and get his commission. And the installation guys are stuck with a job that really needs six more hours on it that they don't have, and so the job comes out poorly. So the way to actually get around this is when you're doing your job costing and when you're doing your net profit per hour, if the company does not make money on a net profit per hour basis, the salesperson doesn't get his commission. Why should the company lose the company and the, and the salesperson win? doesn't work that way. So we want to track our salesperson hours versus our actual install hours to make sure that somebody's not getting a price out there just so that they can get a job and letting it install deal with the fallout. That's not exactly what we want to have happen. And again, we go back to this um, chart that we talk about with selling prices versus the actual net profit per hour prices and showing that gross margins really and truly don't matter. So if you're, if you're paying on gross margin, you're paying the first one we talked about, which was JE, and he made $73.34 an hour, and so he gets paid a percentage of the gross margin of 40%. But if we went down to that HT guy again, and it was a 40.27% gross margin, he still is basically a 40% gross margin, but the company lost $21.37. Why are you paying him a commission when the company lost? doesn't make sense. So that's why you look at this from a whole job perspective, not necessarily paying commission on gross margin only. So make sure you look at total job cost, total net profit per hour, and pay the salesperson based on that rather than just strictly gross margin. Again, this is what we just talked about with number 10. Replacement commissions are based on net profit per hour. They're not based on gross margins. You can still pay off a gross margin. So I'm going to go back to that graph again. And let's assume that you know, if the gross margin is going to be, let's say, 40%, I may pay 10% on that 40% or 5%, assuming that we had a net profit per hour that was positive. So what I would end up doing is I would pay 10% of the gross gross profit, which was $522, and then I, we're still profitable, all right? But that same job, if we're paying 5% on gross profit for that other job, I mean, we're losing more money that way for the HT job. So why would we do that? Why would, why, it makes no sense from a company owner perspective for the company to lose because a salesperson screwed up. Now, there might be occasions where the truck got stuck in a ditch or had an accident or broke down on the way to a job. In that particular case, you pay the salesperson. That was an act of God and you had no control over that one at all. So just make sure that you do it from that perspective. So make sure everybody's winning in this particular case. All right? 
Number 11, inventory is a bet, so purchase very wisely. And I know distributors and suppliers really hate me talking about this, but really and truly, inventory is the biggest bet you make with your business. Go look at your trucks. Go look at your warehouse. How much material is there that's a year old, two years old, three years old, maybe longer, that you've actually you know, ordered, paid for, and is sitting on your shelves gathering dust? That's not what we want to have happen. We want you to buy inventory with the notion that, yeah, I think I can sell this. Yeah, I think I can sell this, but yeah, I can and I did sell it. So that the inventory turns over that whatever you buy, you're actually using. And a lot of times, contractors get sucked in with these great sales that suppliers have because they're trying to get rid of their inventory and put it on your shelves and in your trucks. And so they might have a great sale on condenser fan motors, and they'll give you, and I'm being exaggerating here, they're going to give you, if you buy 10 condenser fan motors, they're going to give them to you at five bucks a piece. And you're going, wow, that's a really great deal. I'll go spend the $50 on those 10 condenser fan motors. But you use three of them. So that's 35 bucks you've wasted. All right? You might not think that's that much, but I think you, you get my point. If you're going to buy something, make sure that it's a good bet and purchase wisely. Don't get sucked into sales. Don't get sucked into these great you know, spring specials, fall specials, end of year specials, and all these other things that I've seen. If it's a good deal and you can use it in a reasonable period of time, i.e., you know, if you've got to pay for the inventory in 30 days, can you use that inventory in 30 days? If the answer is no, don't buy it. Number 12 is to eliminate warehouse supermarkets and have material lists for all of your jobs. And this is what I mean by this. Many times when you're doing your jobs, the, the guys, the field employees go out and installation crews go through the warehouse and they go, I need one of these, two of these, three of these, six of these, whatever. And it's like they have a shopping cart where they can put into it anything they desire because there's no one in control. They look at a material sheet, maybe, and say, yeah, it says I need six, but just in case, I'd better take eight. What happens to those other two? They get left on the job. They get damaged. They get left in a truck, and that's more expense for you. So the best thing to do is to actually lock up your warehouses, have material lists for every job that you're doing, and have somebody pull all of the materials and put them in a special place in the warehouse. You do not give control of the warehouse to any field employee other than the warehouse manager. That's it. Now, from a service perspective, you probably have a locked cage for all of your service parts. And sometimes the dispatcher has the key or the warehouse manager has the key, but sometimes that has to happen. The question also comes up, well, what about on call? And there's many different ways that it gets handled depending upon the size of your company. Some of you may trust your technicians for on-call be able to go into a parts room. Other companies have installed cameras so that when they do go into the parts room, it's a motion-activated camera so you can make sure that they take only what they're supposed to be taking and it goes on their service tickets over the weekend and you check that. So there's lots of different ways to handle it. Um, everybody can have a code into a lock part of the warehouse and you can put motion sensor cameras in there too. Doesn't cost a whole lot, but can save you a whole lot because inventory is a bet, as we learned in number 11. Number 13 is to ask your employees how to save $100 per month. And this might sound really weird, but if you go to your employees and say, hey, we need to cut overhead, how, do, how can we save $10,000 a month? They don't get it. I mean, their own budgets are not $10,000 a month, so they can't put a number on a, you know, a visual way to creatively come up with $100 a month, I mean, $10,000 a month. But if you ask them, well, you know, how can you save $100 a month, they can kind of get that because they can understand $100 a month. It might be not going to Starbucks every day from their personal perspective. So what you look at is if you can break it down into a dollar amount that they can visualize and they can creatively think about how to save $100 a month, and they can come up with those ideas, that would be really cool because if you have 10 employees and each one of them 
can figure out a way to save $100 a month, there, you know, that's a lot of money in savings for you right then and there. But each one of them will come up with something different and reward them for coming up with the ideas if you do implement them. Maybe give them the 100 bucks. All right, my next question to you is, which is most important, cash, cash flow, or profit? And understanding the answer to that really and truly looks at this particular graph. We have a tank of water, and let's assume that that tank is not necessarily water, but there's actually dollars in there. And we have dollars that are coming in. We have a spigot on top where we open it up and we can get cash in, and we have a drain on the bottom where we drain cash out, and the level of, of dollars in the tank goes up and down depending upon cash coming in and cash coming out or going out. And so we get cash in the door. It's important. And you might say, well, cash is the most important. Yes, cash is the one that actually writes your paychecks. However, if you only have a certain level of cash in that tank, every month when you write a paycheck or a bill for the rent or the utilities or whatever, that level of cash is draining, 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 and all of a sudden you have no cash left and you're out of business. But if you have cash flow, i.e. cash coming in and cash going out, that's really, really important because the level goes up, the level goes down. And you get cash in from collections on sales, not necessarily sales themselves, but actually the collections on sales. You can have a million dollars in sales, but if you, have no, you haven't collected your receivables, you can't pay your payroll with a receivable. You've got to have the cash. So cash flow comes in from collections on receivables. You might take out um, a line of credit. I know we talked about not necessarily wanting to do that, wanting you to be your own line of credit. You can put money in yourself, i.e. from your savings account. You can get a little bit of interest these days on your savings account. And you might sell a truck or an asset or something like that. But mainly you get cash in the door from collections, all right, or somebody paying COD. And the level of the tank rises. And then cash goes out simply because we've got to pay payroll and rent and utility bill and da 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 da, -da. And so the level goes up and down. So cash flow is really important. But profitable cash flow is probably the most important. It actually is the most important. And I'll explain that. Many years ago, I worked with a contractor who started his business and grew it to $2 million in 12 years. And what he did was he did it on cash. He never looked at his p &L, he never looked at his balance sheet. As long as he had cash in the bank, he could pay his bill and take his discounts, he was happy. So he had cash coming in, cash going out, so he had, he had cash flow. He reached about $2 million in size and actually growth stopped. And within a couple of months, he started noticing that he didn't have as much cash in the bank, even though cash was still coming in and going out. He couldn't always take his discounts. And every once in a while, he had to make a collection call, which he hated to do, to pay payroll. And what was going on? Well, to make a long story short, he called me on the phone, and I found out that he was losing a nickel for every dollar that he brought in the door for 12 years. A nickel, not a whole lot. So that's why he didn't see it. But once growth stops and growth masks, and growth masks problems because you always have cash and you get complacent and not looking at his material costs, which is where most of it was, they were out the wazoo, and you know, not in productivity issues, and we tightened everything up and we actually raised his prices a little bit. And even at $2 million, he was then profitable. So even though there was cash coming in and going out, every month it was 5% less than it should have been to make sure that it, the cash flow and, the, and it stabilized. So profitable cash flow leads to cash. Right? Profitable sales, profitable cash flow leads to cash. And that's really the way that you want to look at it. Number 15 is to close your door for at least 30 minutes a day. Now, now some of you are thinking, there's no way in God's green earth I can do that. Everybody wants me, everybody needs me, da 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 All right, you can't do it for 30 minutes a day, do it in two 15-minute segments. I, had, I have a CFO of a company I work with who could never, ever, ever get her work done simply because she was being bombarded, you know, constantly. She, she couldn't concentrate for a long period of time, and as you all probably know that if you stop working on something, it takes you a while to get back to, okay, where was I, da 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 and so I put a sign on her door that she was to use and close her door that says, do not enter unless the building's on fire or my daughter is hurt. And she shut her door. Now she shut her door only for you know, a half hour 
at a time or an hour at a time, whatever it is that she absolutely needed to get her work done. And lo and behold, she got her work done. And the door was open most of the time. And everybody learned to respect that 30 minutes or an hour that she closed her door to get everything done that she needed to get done. So she wasn't working all these extra overtime hours anymore. And life became a lot more pleasant for her simply by the fact that she's closing her door an hour a day. And if it's you know month end or year end, it's closed a little bit longer than that. But everybody's learned to respect it, including the owner of the company. So if you've got to get work done, close your door for at least 30 minutes a day. Or go hide someplace for 30 minutes a day. Stay home for an extra 30 minutes a day. If you know that you can't get any work done because everybody's bombarding you, stay home for an extra 30 minutes. And that's what I actually do. If I've got stuff I've absolutely got to get done, I've got a computer set up at my home, and I stay home because the minute I walk in the door, my door goes, everybody goes crazy and everybody wants a piece of me. So I just stay home and do it that way. But you find what works for you so that you get at least 30 minutes of concentrated time every single day to work on the things you need to rather than the emergencies and the fires that your employees want you to solve. Number 16 is to put all of your maintenance agreement revenue in a savings account. Now, here's where everybody goes, starts going, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. But actually you can, all right? Get into the discipline of whenever you have a maintenance agreement, you put that money into that savings account, which becomes your line of credit, which becomes the way that you sleep better at night. And as you do that, then let's assume that you are doing maintenance mainly in one month because of whatever reason, and you do need some of the cash to cover that maintenance work. Fine. Take it out of the savings account based on how many maintenances you're doing, putting it into your operating account, and then actually uh, writing the, the checks against that for payroll or whatever you need to done, get done. But put all the maintenances in a, in a savings account. And I want to show you something. And let's assume that our agreement price is $180. And for plumbing, it's probably going to be half of this. But if you started with zero agreements in, 200, in 2016, and you only added 100 a year, right, which is not a whole lot, within nine years in 2024, you'd have over a million dollars in the bank. And I only asked you to keep half of it in the savings account. So if you earn 18,000 on 100 agreements, I'm only asking you to save nine. All right, so I'm not asking you to even save the whole amount. But if you are consistent about doing this and you are persistent about doing it, not only consistent but persistent, then in 10 years, in this particular case, you're going to have 1.3 million dollars in the bank. And that becomes your line of credit. That becomes the way that you actually sleep better at night and don't have to worry about a bank pulling your line or saying I'm calling your loan. You're your own banker. And that's pretty cool. Um, renewal rates are at 80%. A lot of companies are like 90 or 95% renewal rates depending upon how well they take care of it. So I try to make this very conservative in terms of things that you can do and still generate a little over a million dollars in nine years. If you start with 500 agreements, you'll be about 1.5 million in 10 years. So depending upon where you are and everything along those lines, just go run these numbers and see if, if you are consistent about putting all of your maintenance agreement money away, how much would you have after one year, after two years, after three years, and you keep going. And it's really kind of cool. And the temptation is there. And I must warn you, because as you start getting larger and larger numbers saved up, I've had too many contractors go to either the big boys' toy store or the big girls' toy store. I said, oh, we had a great year. I'm going to take some of my money and just go play with it. I've had boats bought, great cars bought, great trucks bought that were not needed. And, and they went and played. That's your, that's your sleep better at night. That's not your play money. That's the money that you need to make you feel safe and to make you feel good and to make it so that if Murphy comes and bites you in the butt and something goes on with the business that your cash flow goes away, you have it in the bank to support you for the period of time where cash flow went away. Example, I worked with a contractor who was very profitable, very profitable. 
And for about 10 years, he, they did incredibly well. And then one day, he did a lot of new construction work um, and maintenance and service, but a lot of new construction work. He had three GCs go bankrupt on him in a week, the same week, leaving him holding the bag for a million dollars in receivables. Now, had he been doing this program, he would have had a million dollars in the bank. But since he wasn't doing this, he went bankrupt. So you never, ever, ever, ever know what's going to happen. So a million dollars might be great, a million dollars might not be so great. You may need more, depending upon your business. But put the money away and make sure that you absolutely do have something in the bank so that you can sleep better at night. And number 17, in addition to maintenance agreements, is to save 1% of every dollar that comes in the door. And this, again, is persistence and actually being consistent about it. Every time you get a check for $1,000, you write a check for $10 and put it in a savings account. And these are two different savings accounts. One savings account says maintenance agreement. The other one just says savings. And you know, how, much, how much revenue did you do last year? How much actual cash came in the door last year? Let's assume you had a million dollars come in the door in cash last year. That would be um, $10,000 that would be in that savings account. Probably not as much as your maintenance money, but if you want to go play with this money, go play with this money. Don't play with your maintenance money. And since we have a little bit of time before I have to stop and, at, and ask, answer any questions that you have, I want to give you a number 18. And number 18 is this, is to send your bank statements home. It has absolutely, in the short run, nothing to do with profitability, but it has everything to do with people stealing from you. Um, over the past 28, 30 years that I've been in this business, I have seen so much embezzlement from bookkeepers, from deal personnel. It doesn't actually have to be cash. I've seen stealing parts, stealing pieces, stealing copper, stealing whatever. And you want to make sure that your hard-earned money stays safe. So we're going to address the financial piece of it since I have a little bit of time. And essentially what we want to have happen is when you send your bank statements home, you are the first one to look at the microfiche with all of the pictures of the signatures and all everything, the checks that come in. If your bookkeeper knows that you are looking at all of the checks and you're the first one before she balances the checkbook, she's not going to write a check to herself. Or if she does, she knows that you're going to see it and start questioning it. She might still be writing a check to ABC Inc. and ABC Corp. And that you have to, to look at too. But the likelihood is you're going to keep the honest people honest. And I'll give you an example of why. I worked with a guy in Tampa. And he had hired a bookkeeper. And she was a great bookkeeper. She was very accurate. For about th and she'd been working there for about three years when she went and had into this nasty divorce. And her attorney said, if I don't get my check for $3,000 by Friday, I'm dropping your case. So what did she do? She forged a check. And these were the days before the microfiches. So she said, I'll just pull the check. And he'll never see it because I balanced the checkbook. The banker called him and said, do you know lawyer XYZ? He just happened to be looking at the account. And the owner said, no. Why? He said, well, I got this check for $3,000 goes running down to the bank, and sure enough, there's a check for $3,000 to an attorney he doesn't know with a funny-looking signature on it. Goes back and confronts the bookkeeper. And she says, breaks down in tears, and da 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 And he said to her, why didn't you come to us? We, you know we loan money. You take it out of payroll deductions every single week. No, 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 no. She ended up in jail. So instead of thinking rationally, which she wasn't doing because of this, she thought emotionally, thought she can get away with it because she balanced the checkbook. The guys never looked at the check, and she couldn't. So she ended up with her life ruined because of a procedure that, had he had that in place, she never would have done. So this procedure actually is the first line of defense and embezzlement, and it actually also allows you to keep the honest people honest. She probably would have come to them you know, had she not had this, ah, oh, I can just do this, I'll never see it type of attitude. So that becomes very, very important. So at the end of this, which I need to kind of, yeah, I need to 
answer questions now. Um, please call your bankers if you, you're not sending your bank statements home and, and, and do it. And it's not only your employees, it could be your vendors, because I had a vendor change a check from 50 bucks to 550 bucks. Owner saw it, brought it all into the bookkeeper and said, this doesn't look right. She pulled the back up. Nope, it's not. They went to the bank. The bank went after the vendor. So it's not only your people who are stealing. It could be your vendors. Look at your bank statement. It is the first line of defense in everything that you do. All right. I've got about five minutes left, and I will take questions. All right, Ruth. Um, we had a question come in earlier, um, and this is regarding gross margins and net margins. But So the old method is on gross margin and not net margin. Could you revisit that real quick? Okay. The old method is you divide by one minus the gross margin. And the old method only looks at sales minus cost of sales is equal to gross profit because gross margin is your percentage of gross profit. The new method, when you're looking at net profit per hour, it's actually done in dollars rather than, than in percentages, which is where you are in the old method. You're actually looking at dollars now, and you're taking into consideration your overhead cost per hour when you're doing that. Um, so just had a follow-up to that. So gross margins don't consider overhead. Correct. Gross margins do not consider overhead. That's how we had that. I showed you those two examples here. Let me go back to that example. Where we've got the gross margin of 40.51% and 40.27, and we made $73.34 an hour or lost $21.37. And you can also look, you know, we had one that was towards the bottom, which is LP, which is 19.41%, but they still made $52 an hour. And using the old method, you go, oh my gosh, I only grossed 19%, I'm going to lose my butt on this job. No, not in this particular case. You actually made $52 for every hour you were on that job. So that's why the percentages and gross margins are really can give you a false sense of security. Um, can you share tip number eight again? Share tip number eight. Okay, let's see what was eight. I go right past. Oh, I missed eight. Good. So 18 became 8. <laughs> I'm sorry. So there was no number 8 as we went through this. I apologize for that. I totally missed it. So the, the one that I gave you was to send your bank statements home. That can be tip number 8. How's that? Ah, OK. How do we calculate billable hour rate if we pay on commission basis? OK. What you're going to do if you pay on commission, you calculate the number of, you know, if you're paying on commission, they still have to submit a timesheet. So you've got an, a sense of how many billable hours they had on their timesheet, right? Most, I mean, most states still require, even if you pay on commission, that you pay at least the minimum wage for whatever that state is, and it's different in different states. So even though you're paying on commission, you still have to maintain some sort of of timesheet for that person, and that's where you wouldn't consider all of those hours billable. One more question here. Um, my company has a flat rate book. Oh, sorry, it must be a, a follow-up to what you were saying. Uh, my company has a flat rate book, and we want to create our own book. Why? <laughs> I know I can't answer that question. Why? I think that you guys do what you do really, really, really well, which is go out and help customers and leave the creation of those flat rate books, which generally there's several people in the country doing them. They keep track of all the pricing. They keep track of all the changes in part costs and everything else like that. And let them do it that they are really, really good at. And just incorporate the cost of the flat rate book in your, in your pricing. And that's what I would do. I wouldn't spend the time doing any of the things that we're talking about here. I mean, I wouldn't spend the time on a flat rate book rather than, than doing the things that we're talking about here because your flat rate book takes so much time spended on generating revenue or profit. 